and you got to find a way to make sure that Jokic is not getting everybody else involved. Make him score the mm -hmm. ball. You got to mm -hmm. take away his points or his assists. He cannot have both. When teams mm. play against Jokic, you, you turn him into a scorer, you turn him into a passer, and he controls the game. You, he only had four assists tonight. Yeah, that, that, that's ridiculous. You know, <laughs> it's just... That's the untrained eye yeah. that, that says yes, something like that. Yes, how are the eyes today, Pat? Are they trained? Let's go around the horn. Talking about you, Clint Yates. Come on, as you talk wow. to you guys. Untrained eye is an, it, it's incredible. It's an incredible line. My eyes are very well trained. Thank you. Hey, I'll take it any way we get it. We have a series. We have a series despite what some of you cough, Woody Page, cough, uh, said when you picked the sweep, cough, Woody Beach, okay? Ain't no sweep. We have a fun game last night and a clinic for Miami in the fourth quarter offensively. By some statistical measures, the most efficient quarter in the entire season this year. 19 possessions, 36 points. So for it to come on the road after being down by double digits like that, what a win for Miami. Here's Mike Malone on his nuggets after the game. Our defense has to be a hell of a lot better. That's two fourth quarters now in game one and two where our fourth quarter defense has been non-existent. This is not the preseason. This is not the regular season. It's not round. This is the NBA Finals. And that to me is really, really perplexing, disappointing. Israel, was game two about the changes Miami made or Denver's non-existent defensive effort? I would lean toward the, la <clears throat> toward the latter and that defensive effort in large part because if you look at, so, if you just watch the game and see some of the positions where the players were in to defend Heat players, they just weren't close enough to them. And I don't know if that was an effort thing or if that was a finer detail thing when it comes to the game plan. But if you go back to game one, the Heat had a lot of the same wide open jump shots. They just didn't make them. This game, they made them. They beat the Nuggets with offensive execution and firepower, frankly. And they've, you know, their three point shooting, like it has somehow been all season, all postseason long, was fantastic for them yesterday. And so the adjustment for Denver is yes, maybe to stick to their shooters a little bit more and not be caught sort of in no man's land a lot of the time. But again, that was the same thing that happened in game one. So was it an effort thing in game two for Michael Malone's uh, Nuggets? or was it just part of the game plan? The Heat are going to out-execute you regardless of t what uh, round we're in, what uh, opponent it is, and they did that again in game two, and it just goes to show you that good coaching comes a long way mm. even in the finals. That's the panelists from Southern Florida. I see Woody in Denver. Hold on a second, Woody. We'll go to Frank Isola here. Was it more about the adjustments Miami made or the lack of defensive effort, as their coach said, from Denver? Yep. Yeah, Michael Malone hit it exactly right. I also think basketball IQ. I can, they, the Nuggets reminded me of the Celtics from Game 7. Like, you didn't expect the Miami Heat, after losing Game 1, to come out and play with what the godfather, Pat Riley, always talks about, playing with force. They were so soft, and they were so unorganized. How many defensive mistakes did they make? When you play Miami, disciplined, organized, well-coached, and be fair, they knocked down 17 three-pointers, which had a lot to do with it. But Miami played that game like they wanted to win it. Denver played it like, well, we already won this series. We won game one, right? That's the way it works. Uh, that's not about stealing a game either on the road. That's about them going out and earning that road win. Uh, Lynn Yates, turn to you here. Are you with uh, Frank and Israel here? This was all about Miami taking advantage of Denver's defensive effort and lack thereof? I think it was about Miami taking advantage of who they are themselves. Their scoring was more balanced. They looked like they were in this game. They looked like they remembered it was the NBA Finals, which is not what had happened in game one. And I'll give a lot of credit to Spo, though. Although, I got to say, I disagree. Untrained eyes are not. The bottom line is that when Jokic <laughs> scores more than 40 <laughs> points in a playoff game this year, the Nuggets lose. So whether or not I need to look at that or count that with my hands, that's the reality of the circumstance. So, you know, he can talk to people while he wants. It worked. And that's that's what the biggest part about all this is. We've talked about all these teams that kind of play well against the Nuggets. They haven't beat them at home yet. The Heat actually did it. All right. And now to Denver. Woody Page. Well, it's not the sweep that you predicted. And some would say you took joy in predicting. But please go ahead on last night and the lack of defensive effort in the fourth quarter. Well, first, Tony, though, I will burn the broom. All right, settle down. We don't need an open flame anywhere <laughs> wow. near here. Please, yeah. Yeah. Please, give that to Natasha and have her make sure that's taken care of. Go. Let me go through this quickly, though. A lot of good points have been made, except in New York. Well, how does he know what's going on in this series? He's not anywhere close to it. But I will say this, that the changes that 
Spolster made in putting Kevin Love in the lineup, that really made a difference. It took uh, Aaron Gordon really out of the game offensively. Number two, uh, making those uh, three-pointers was a big difference. When you make 50% of your three-pointers on the road or at home, that's going to actually mean so much to you. The third thing uh, that uh, Malone's talking about, the lack of effort, he needs to look in the mirror. He's the coach of the team. You're the one who prepares them to go out. And if your effort is not good, their effort's not going to be good. So that's number uh, three. Number four, I think the, the, the series still can be the Nuggets and belong to them, and it might be a gentleman's broom. That's exactly what will happen. Okay, we don't mean to make predictions here. I'm it. looking for – you were there, all right? And to see it play out, they had an eight-point lead at the start of the fourth quarter at home after – you know, you, you said their home court advantage was everything. To give it up like they did, is that not concerning? Uh, I'm surprised that uh, at the altitude in the fourth quarter, teams usually disintegrate. Well, the Heat in both games have played better than the fourth quarter than the home team that's used to playing here. But I would add this, because nobody else is going to bring it up, there was not a goaltending call that should have been made, and there was an out-of-bounds play that everybody saw that Butler was out of bounds when he flipped it to Lowry for a three-pointer. That's a five-point difference in the game, and the Nuggets would have won. So I'll defend them, and I don't okay. think this series well, is going to now be over soon. It's going to last a long officiating time. Officiating was very much under the spotlight when the Heat had only two free throws in game one. Yeah. They came back, they had 18 more. That was basically even, but there were those. Frank, you call goaltending on that play? No, I mean, stop with that. You can go through Absolutely. the entire game. There are missed calls. Denver was due to lay an egg. They had won was eight game straight game. home games in the playoffs, seven straight in a row. But I'm going to tell you something. There was a play in the first half where Jamal Murray stole the ball, goes in for a breakaway layup. Who's chasing him down? Max Struess. I get it. It was a three-point play. That's a little message that Miami was going to send. We're going to compete every single possession. Denver did not do that. And let's remember another guy. Duncan Robinson at the start of the fourth quarter was outstanding. He completely changed the game. Let's talk strategy. The, I have to take away one thing away from Jokic, which Clinton Yates gets a trademark for, and that Eric Spolstra poo-pooed and poo -poo plattered with Ramona. But could there be something to that, Israel? Or could it be like Steve Kerr told Draymond Green on Green's pod last night, late night after the game, Jamal Murray is the head of the snake and not Jokic, is? Well, let's let's look at the other side for a quick second because uh, Frank just mentioned Duncan Robinson, and if you're the Nuggets, you have to prepare for what? Jimmy Butler taking over. You have to prepare for Bam Adebayo initiating offense, and then all of a sudden in the second half, you have to prepare for Duncan Robinson initiating offense, and you're just like, what are we what are we doing? We're not prepared for this. You look at the other side. It's pretty much the Murray Jokic pick and roll. And I'm not saying that it's easy to defend. It's probably the most difficult one in the league to defend. But if you have to do it over and over again, you can get into a rhythm doing so. And when it comes to making Jokic the scorer, the Miami Heat are not a team that believes you can pick your poison. They want to take it all away. And so they made every part of it difficult for Jokic. And when he needed to, when he was the MVP, he just went bang, 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 six, seven dribbles and took it up, frankly, against pretty good defense. So the idea that they're just letting Jokic score, again, not necessarily true. It just so happened it worked out for them. Ideally for the Heat, he'll miss a few of those shots in the next game and they win even more comfortably. Frank Isola. All right, so when you're watching that game, the fourth quarter starts, it's an eight-point lead. You think, you know what, they've cut off the head of the snake and they're going to win this game. Jokic was absolutely rolling. It wasn't about offense. It was about what was happening on the defensive end of the court. That's where they weren't getting it done. Miami does a great job. I get it. The problem was he's not getting a lot of assists because Michael Porter Jr. is not cutting to the basket. Jamal Murray wasn't playing well offensively. And those guys, it impacts them on the defensive end. So at the start of the fourth quarter, you cannot tell me that Eric Spolster is sitting there like Phil Jackson with his legs crossed thinking, we have them figured out right now. I'm not buying that. Woody, how much stock do you put in what Frank just said, that struggling on the offensive end impacts Porter Jr., maybe Gordon, and some of the other Nuggets players defensively? Yes, well, first of all, Jokic is the head of the snake. If anything, Murray's the throat of the snake, and Michael J. Por Michael J. Porter last night was the tail of the snake. He didn't even show up for the game. And so here's the situation. Defensively, I think the Miami Heat, if you want to talk about defense, I think the Miami Heat played a better defense than the Nuggets did last night. So that was the difference in the game. And it's not about making uh, Jokic uh, score 40 points. It's about 
protecting everybody else from scoring anything. And that's exactly what happened when you got KCP not doing anything except fouling on three-pointers twice that made uh, a difference in the game. That, that Porter, as we talked about, was not doing anything offensively or defensively. Gordon was taken out by Love, and, and Murray just didn't get into his rhythm with Jokic until late in the game. So all of those factors yep. led to what was the loss for the Nuggets at home. Clinton Yates. Jokic had 68 passes that led to only 13 shots, which was the lowest percentage in that right. realm right. for him in the playoffs period, which is what Frank is referring to. But more largely, regarding Kerr, I don't look at the Nuggets as a snake. They are closer to a tarantula, an arachnoid with many <laughs> different legs and eyeballs on the front with an engine in the back in Murray. I don't think that that analogy is, in fact, apt for how that they play. And so, no, I don't actually view it that way because they do have, if not big pieces, the same way you might consider the Heat because you know their names, they do have pieces that they can go to that that's what makes Jokic so scary. When Israel Gutierrez's last word after the horn. Look, I'll say the same thing about Murray that people said about Butler after game one and even game two. He's just got to do more. You look at Gabe Vincent going on that pick and roll and pulling up in the mid range and affecting yeah, his Gabe team. Vince was great. Jamal Murray Ooh. can do the same thing, just do it more often. Michael Lamar Porter Jr. What are you not Michael J. Porter? Although I love it. Back to the future with Michael J. Porter. I love it. Let's go. The future, Murray. Buy or sell next. Get back on defense. Story. I'm not sure if you're ready. I need to know if you're ready. Uh, this is from The Athletic and from Bleacher Report. It's sort of Shams Tarani. had this in the morning. And it's Kyrie Ernie, Irving. And it's that Kyrie has reached out to LeBron about LeBron coming to Dallas to play with him. And uh, that's Lee Luca. So LeBron, Luca, and Kyrie. Clinton Yates, I turn to you. Debate that LeBron should want to go to Dallas to play with Kyrie. Absolutely not. LeBron, you've already saved one franchise or two franchises already in this league. Don't make it Dallas. I figured Kyrie reached out when, I don't know, he was sitting on the wood, not in a uniform for Lakers playoff games down here at Crypto.com Center. Of course, they talk all the time. That doesn't mean it's a good idea for LeBron to go out there and hang out with Woody, Mark Cuban. should LeBron consider this? Should he want to do this? We know it would take a trade of, of enormous proportions too, Woody. Uh, not a chance of that. You're going to give up AD to go out there and play with Kyrie again. That's not a possibility. Uh, you've got a much better team right where you are. You're where you want to be in Hollywood, California. Why would you go to Dallas and play with a team that is messed up for the last five or six years? Israel, it's not Saturday. just Kyrie. Luca would ostensibly be involved in this yeah. equation should LeBron want to go play with Luca. No. Well, I thought Kyrie wanted us to all leave him alone. I thought that's what he said on his Instagram live, but now he's leaking the story. Um, look, I, I do not think it's a great idea. LeBron James has already been on a super team, if you will, with two with two guys that wanted the ball all the time, and him and Dwayne Wade. And now you're going to have a third guy. I can just imagine all the images of all three of them asking for the ball at the top of the circle. Not a really good fit uh, chemistry-wise. Not a really good fit personality-wise, I would say. So, no. Frank Gaisola. Is he's 100% right. Kyrie reprimanded the media, the fans. Don't talk about me. Now I feel uncomfortable doing this. But it's so funny. Should he go to Dallas and play with Kyrie? I think if LeBron were to jump through hoops to try to get to Dallas, he's going there to play with Luka Doncic. And Kyrie, remember, you left LeBron. Why did you do that? When he was the best thing that happened in your career, just like he was the best thing that happened to Kevin Love's career and Anthony Davis's career. All right. We'll move on then. News of the night. Puck dropping for Game 2 of the Stanley Cup Final. That'll be in about three hours. And how Florida responds to getting hit in the mouth for the first time in a month will be one thing. And whether Vegas, habitual mouth punchers that they are, can be stopped offensively. Third period explosion Saturday night. White Cloud, Stone, and Smith gave Vegas the 5-2 Game 1 win. Israel, the Panthers are your account, so you can start from their perspective. What needs to change tonight for Florida, even the series? Oh, man, that stone uh, goal was a backbreaker. But look, they just, frankly, need to get better from their best players. Matthew Kachuk needs to play better. Sam Bennett needs to play better. Nick Cousins, if he just goes top shelf on a couple of those, and one in particular, uh, has a couple of goals uh, in that game. So it does feel like they were that close. They can convince themselves of that and rebound in game two. All right, guys, Sola? You know what? they got to figure out a way to just be resilient. Remember, they've gone 11-2 and two since they fell behind 3-1 to the Bruins in that series. So this is a team that can bounce back. My issue would be Vegas is better, and right now Aiden Hill, 33 saves in game one. He's been pretty good. Glenn Yates. 
Yeah, but you can't expect to win a Stanley Cup final game in which you give up a shorty. Izzy's right. They just have to play better hockey. Oh, for everything on the power play, hitting posts left and right, losing the psychological battle. Being that plucky team playing with house money is not always going to take you all the way to Cup. Just ask the 2019 Vegas Knights. They got there, didn't win. 40 page. Uh, the Panthers can't get up the hill. They can't get past the hill. They have got to get something out of their front line, and they've got to compete against those defensemen from the Vegas Knights. They're contributing so much in the series. They're controlling both ends of the court, I'm sorry, the ice, because they are not only defending against uh, the Panthers, they're scoring goals and assists. And we're talking about McNabb and Haig and those guys. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They've got to figure One out a way to solve them. For Florida, I mean, there was a long layoff because they disposed of the Eastern Conference so quickly. And then in the third period, things just went off the rails so quickly like that. Should be fun tonight. We'll move on. Buy or sell three. Rose Zhang. Talk about meeting the hype. 20 years old, two-time NCAA champ, her first LPGA tournament, playing on a sponsor's exemption, and she wins it and wins it in dramatic fashion with a clutch playoff performance. First player in 72 years to win their debut tournament. Clinton, buy or sell a LPGA tour changing moment. Buying every single part of this, a star on the LPGA Tour, getting shout outs from other tour people that we know. This is fantastic. When I first heard the name, I was like, where have I heard that from? Oh, right. It was last week when she was busy winning titles as well. This is a fantastic achievement on every level. You have outshone everybody in your graduating class by a mile. Woody Page. I'd like 15 points to make here, Tony. (laughs) I think, first of all, she's got the most pipes since we saw Michelle Wee. She's got a smooth stroke on the green. She's got a great takeaway on her driver. She uh, was so impressive in Augusta National this year. If you watch that women's amateur championship, she won in playoff. She can play under pressure. She is from California and Stanford. Who went to Stanford? Tiger Woods. Okay. She could be the female possibility. All right, all right. Wikipedia. You're not making 18 points. Israel Gutierrez, please. Well, I think that's why there maybe is a hesitancy to sort of embrace the next LPGA superstar because we thought Michelle Wee was going to be the Tiger Woods on the woman's side, and she really didn't quite live up to that. But if you're going to start this way and then get all the hype, I think it's a lot easier for people to follow. Mm-hmm. Isola. Woody, thanks for reading her Wikipedia page. WNBA has players we recognize, women's track and field, certainly women's tennis. This is so, It's great for her, great for golf, what she's done. You don't need to make 18 points. You just need to make one, Frank. You're already into the showdown. And I think the LPGA. But he's still going. <laughs> that altitude Sweep not affecting out. him. Yeah. Sweep him out. <laughs> Get that broom. Judy Ares and Isola, the two that had Miami winning the series and had him on Friday in showdown. Israel Gutierrez, Frank Isola, good luck in showdown. Marcel Ozuna, a 415-foot single. Because he admired it, and when it came up short, he only made it to first. After the inning, he was benched. All right. So we all agree he's not hustling, and that's why he was benched. But we've seen this before. We've seen the benching before, and we see it again no matter what. So, Israel, here's your debate. Does benching for this work? I mean, it really depends on the player. I don't know if it works or not, but you have to do it there. Not only was he pimping it, but he stared. He was checking to see if it was going to go out. You only pimp it if you know it's going out. It doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. Frank Isola? It works. It works for good teams, and certainly the Braves are that. The manager knows the pulse of the locker room. It's early June. Those are the kind of plays that can okay. cost you in October. It's smart to so do it. So none of you are biting Sorry. on my little. All right. I, 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 I feel what you're saying here. Israel, you said you only pimp if you know it's going out. No, you pimp it when you're just feeling it, man. He was feeling it. We'll move on. French Open controversy. Check this out. When a ball hits a ball person, is it grounds for disqualification? Here's the moment in question. It's in between points. You see the ball was being reset to the ball person, and the ball person gets struck. The attendant goes down. The umpire initially gave a warning and was ready to move forward, but the opposing team pointed out that the attendant was in pain, and they said she was bleeding, and that is when it was ruled a DQ. Frank, debate. Is that DQ worthy? 
I think it is. Novak Djokovic got kicked out of the U.S. Open for doing it. I know it wasn't hit that hard, but the ball person was looking at the other players. I don't like the other team asking for her to get kicked out. That's like... I, I like mean, this is totally different. This was a slice that was heading toward the ball person. The ball girl saw it and just didn't react. And yeah, it probably hurt her. But for the other team to call yeah. the DQ for that, that's you cannot bullshit. have the other team calling for the DQ. You can't. That should be a DQ. If you call for DQ, you get DQ'd. Israel Gutierrez, that's enough to win the face. Thank you, Tony. And everybody's fallen in love with Eric Spolster as a head coach, and rightfully so. He is a fantastic head coach, probably the best one in the league right now. But in 2011, in the NBA Finals against Rick Carlisle and the Dallas Mavericks, he got badly outcoached. He got outcoached against his zone and basically did a lot of the same things he did for years before that with the Miami Heat. You can find out that and a lot more on a podcast called Four Years of Heat with iHeartRadio and the NBA, <laughs> hosted by me. Whoa, that was all- Episode he three. The lead. Out today. He to an untrained eye, you wouldn't know that was a pump right there.